thanks, Arisha. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Wilhelm van Rensburg, Senior Art Specialist at Strauss & Company. And I'm very pleased to facilitate uh, the first in a series of webinars we've organized uh, for you to coincide with a special exhibition that Lee Leider and I put together in Cape Town. And today our topic, as you can see on the screen there, is giving historical context conditions within which figuration is being produced and consumed in Africa. We have uh, quite an impressive lineup of panelists for you. You can see them uh, over there. Oliver in Wonwu, and Hoboleng Molloy, Alison Kearney, and uh, Sean O'Toole, and uh, as I will introduce, uh, as I will introduce them to you, we will talk more about uh, the work that they are doing in the arts. I mentioned that uh, we are um, uh, that we are uh, 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 mounting this series of um, uh, of talks um, to coincide with uh, an exhibition that uh, that runs at uh, Belgemeent. Uh, and I will just uh, get uh, the the slideshow to work in a second for you. Um, and uh, then uh, we, can, we can talk about that. Yeah, the exhibition, Giving Direction, Figuration, Past and Present, it, uh, will be opening next week, Monday, the 14th um, of February, and it will run for a whole week to coincide with the Cape Town Art Fair, as you can see that. And it will be mounted at Belgemeen, the historical home set uh, in, uh, in uh, Cape Town. Uh, now, first and uh, foremost, I just want to introduce you to what Lee and I uh, understand with the term figuration. Now, figuration in our minds uh, deal with a uh, conceptual thread that runs through historical, traditional, modern, and up to contemporary African art. Uh, and uh, as you can see from these two examples that are on the exhibition, that um, we look at modernist um, antecedents for what, uh, uh, what uh, contemporary artists actually do with figuration. Figuration is nothing else uh, but a category in, uh, in art, same as landscapes and still lifes, where artists uh, portray portraits, figures, group, uh, uh, group uh, portraits, uh, people's interiors and the like. Uh, and uh, we use uh, these two examples to show you a uh, uh, portrait of a Congolese uh, woman painted in 1938. Uh, and we juxtapose that with uh, a work that was done uh, 80 years later in 2018 by Zanile Nahole. And the point that we want to make here is that figuration operates on a continuum. A modernist African artist, for example, I think used the portrait to pursue formalist ideas about their subject matter, such as you can see from the Stern portrait. And I think uh, she would uh, uh, pursue the portrait in terms of uh, expressionism. She studied in uh, uh, Germany, of course, under the expressionists, and she brought uh, that uh, to South Africa. And Sean at a uh, later point will, uh, will I'm sure, talk uh, uh, more about that. Whereas when contemporary African artists use figuration, they view it from a completely different point of view. I think more from contemporary issues, such as issues of identity, issues of race, um, issues of post-coloniality, uh, uh, issues of gender and the like. And that is the point uh, that uh, we really want to make. Even if you look at traditional African art, such as you can see from the examples on the left, uh, where the human figure uh, features pri uh, uh, prominently, and you compare that to a contemporary work by Deborah Bell, you can actually see uh, that line um, continue, uh, continuing there. Uh, figuration in uh, traditional African art here, with uh, very interesting, uh, the proportions here, the head is actually one third of the total length of the body, uh, the second third, uh, the torso and uh, the legs there. So it's actually interesting to look at uh, all of uh, those. Um, so that in terms of figuration, what about the period we're looking at? Um, now I try to demarcate that by looking at uh, dates. I'm a die art, art historian, I like my dates. So a recent publication 
collaboration by Fiden. Uh, it appeared at the end of last year, African artists from 1882 to now. And again, you'll see that Fiden tried to capture that whole period uh, that we are looking for, but you can imagine quite vast, quite a, a, an impressive book, but I thought I'd demarcate it slightly more by looking at 1995 to 1990, uh, 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 1945 to 1994. Uh, these are dates uh, chosen by Okwe Nmezo when he curated an absolutely seminal exhibition in 2001 uh, called The Short Century. Uh, he, of course, aligned uh, the art production, and you can see the various uh, uh, strands of uh, the arts running along the right-hand side, all the way down uh, the cover of the catalog. And he aligns uh, the art production with uh, the thrust of independence in Africa. Um, the first African uh, country to gain independence uh, was certainly Ghana in 1958. But I think um, the nationalist uprisings and movements started just after the Second World War with probably the independence of India in 1947. Um, and uh, then that idea idea of African modernism or modernist African art was taken up by uh, a number of curators and writers, such as you can see from the cover of this catalogue of an exhibition at the Whitechapel in London. It moved to Malmo in Sweden, as well as the Guggenheim in New York, 1995. Um, and um, uh, they tell the, uh, well, the stories, uh, uh, the history, the modernist history of art in Africa. Even in academia, Academia, uh, the, uh, the concept of African mod modernism uh, greatly researched, such as you can see here from a special edition of the South Atlantic Quarterly, um, uh, published by Duke University in the US, that devoted a whole special edition on African modernism in 2010. Um, in South Africa, we also had uh, the fortune of um, uh, being able to see a very special exhibition in 2008 during the very first Johannesburg Art uh, Fair uh, with a special exhibition curated by Stevenson Gallery as well as Johannes Bormann Gallery called Take Your Road and Travel Along, the advent of uh, the modern uh, Black artist in Africa. Uh, and um, so, but I also uh, always want to, uh, to, to, to pinpoint the exact date when, or the exact year, if you like, when uh, contemporary art started, and I quite fancy 1989. Uh, there are a number of reasons, and uh, I'm backed up by quite a number of publications for choosing that particular date. First and foremost, the fall of the Berlin Wall in that year, and effectively the end of communism and the advent of uh, new liberalism and late capitalism. Uh, we also had the Tiananmen Square massacre and the focus on global human rights. Uh, then of course, uh, I think we take it for granted, but that was the year when the World Wide Web was uh, widely uh, beginning to be used uh, in that particular year. And for us as uh, uh, you know, people in the art world, a seminal exhibition, uh, Magicians of the Earth uh, at the Centre Pompidou uh, and the Grand Hall de Ballet in Paris, curated by Jean Hubert Matteau, drawing the attention to contemporary African artists. Up to that point, contemporary African artists were largely ignored by big uh, 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 exhibitions, biennales, art fairs, and the like. And uh, Martin actually draw the attention to that. You can imagine, imagine the criticism, straightforward magicians of the earth. Uh, but that uh, has been um, uh, addressed by uh, a number of subsequent uh, exhibitions and, uh, and curators. Uh, I'm not too far off with the date. If you look at this publication by Okwe Mezor and Chika Okeke Agulu, uh, Contemporary African Art Since 1980, also a seminal book. Uh, in, uh, in this regard. But again, you know, uh, modernist African art or uh, African modernism, a vast field, if you can imagine. And so I want to take uh, my lead from uh, Sydney Littlefield Custer, who uh, this is the second edition of uh, Contemporary African Art. And she highlights a number of very useful uh, issues, categories, if you like, 
to look at that shift between modern and uh, uh, modernist and uh, contemporary African art. And some of the speakers today uh, would, would, uh, would talk about some of uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these issues. And so that brings me to our first speaker. And it, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Oliver Nwonwu. Um, he is an artist in his own right. Uh, he uh, was the, uh, uh, just uh, the, the past president of uh, the Society of Nigerian Artists for a number of decades. And for me, very, very important, he was the founder of the Omenka online platform uh, that he started in 2001. Very welcome, uh, uh, Oliver. And I want you to talk about uh, first of, uh, of this Omenka platform, uh, if, uh, if you like. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Wilhelm. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Omenka um, is not only an online platform, but it's also printed uh, quarterly. And uh, it's also um, um, printed across, or published rather, across uh, an app. Uh, Omenka, I'd like to say, is uh, one of Africa's leading uh, magazines. Um, on art and the visual culture of Africa, and of course, uh, her related diaspora. Uh, we promote the work of uh, modern and contemporary African artists and those working in diaspora. Um, we watch uh, auction trends. Uh, we try as much as possible to um, put a, a pulse on uh, contemporary and even modern art developments uh, on the African continent. So that in a nutshell is Omenka, and it's very related to uh, the Omenka Gallery, which is also a leading gallery in um, Lagos, Nigeria. We've uh, promoted the work of, um, of um, artists uh, whose work resonates uh, resonate very strongly with the African continent. And uh, to that uh, effect, we've um, uh, shown the work of um, African artists across uh, four continents and in major art fairs, including one five for the Joburg Art Fair, Cape Town Art Fair, Loop in Barcelona, and uh, the Armory in New York. Uh, and what we do is to ensure sustainable presence for contemporary art from Africa and our related diaspora. Uh, uh, so, so, so the platform itself, uh, does that, uh, can artists just mm. upload their stuff such as this or not really? I see Zander Blom, a uh, well-known South African contemporary artist there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so uh, we, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we have interviews on the leading artists. Uh, we have conversations with them to ensure that people have a, a deeper understanding of their work, their techniques and underlying philosophy. And our aim of course is to promote the art of the continent. And then through the Manka Gallery, which for me and for many is like a sister um, um, organization, we uh, show their work and through large themed exhibitions and sometimes solo exhibitions, uh, we work even in conjunction with uh, international galleries to ensure that uh, the art of Africa is well promoted to new audiences all over the world. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, also, I think um, uh, uh, people uh, people know that uh, you also um, founded the uh, Ben Enwongu Foundation. Is that also part of Omenka? <clears throat> uh, it's uh, another sister operation. Uh, it's established to preserve my, my late father's legacy and incidentally, he is widely celebrated as uh, Africa's most influential artist of the 20th century. Uh, before his appearance on the scene, uh, the art profession was largely one of ridicule. But uh, I'd like to say that, um, for many, I'd like to say that uh, he contributed greatly to a new visual vocabulary for African uh, uh, modern art. Um, just before his time, or even during his time, in the early part of his career, uh, just as you rightly mentioned, um, African modernists were largely ignored, you know, thinking that uh, their works were of the pale copycat uh, phenomenon. You know, meanwhile, um, it's uh, very important to say that uh, uh, some of the greater uh, modern movements in art actually took from the geometric forms and shapes of African traditional uh, uh, sculpture. So um, artists like Benewon, like uh, Gerard Sokoto, like Iris Van Korba, like Yusuf Grillo, they were the very font of uh, championing modern art in Africa, and they brought their own verve. And uh, Benewa was largely credited because he fused, you know, he um, fused the indigenous aesthetics 
of Africa and our folklore with uh, the Western academic training that he had at the Slade. And I think for me, that uh, uh, is one of the um, legacies that um, he was able to bequeath to um, African art. And so the foundation was established to preserve his legacy. We do that through exhibitions of his work and other artists' works. Uh, we have large themed exhibitions, you know, to um, chart uh, the progress of uh, contemporary African art. Uh, we also um, 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 have talks, seminars, especially um, um, one, um, uh, one that I'll mention is a point of view, which we have in collaboration with Alliance Francaise. So through talks like that, we ensure the relevance or we contribute to how relevant and the role art plays in society away from just the decorator. Okay, so I mentioned uh, early on the short century and uh, Okwe Inez, or, you know, he, start, uh, he starts his catalog uh, with the section on fine art and these he called the, uh, these three artists he called the triumvirate, you know, he put them right right at the top uh, he chose 50 artists to exhibit on that exhibition and these were the top three uh, uh ernest mangoba gerard Sokoto, ben uh, in one woo and you can see the synergy here you can see the idea of figuration uh, even in the work of uh, uh, Mankoba, uh, if you, uh, those of you who know uh, his art and who follows his uh, uh, trajectory would know that uh, this is basically uh, uh, based on a, a Zairean uh, uh, traditional African figurine uh, and then he translate that into modern terms and that is really as uh, Oliver uh, uh, mentioned you know it wasn't just a one-way street you know Europe telling Africa what modernism is all about this is Africa's major contribution all three of these artists I think contributed vastly to the understanding of uh, what modernism globally uh, is all about, and you can see the idea of uh, figuration in uh, in all three of uh, these top top African modernists. Um, now, I just want to Oliver. I just want to take you back to this particular uh, uh, exhibition and catalogue, and in it we find very interesting work about bends. Uh, so here is one example on that particular exhibition. Uh, here's another one. Uh, and uh, even this uh, portrait, and I want to show you know the stylistic uh, development. Uh, any 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 thoughts about uh, these uh, these uh, these works? Yes, of course. Uh, these are some of the very early pieces, and uh, what you'll notice a connecting thread all through. You'll notice the rhythm, the movement, even in the trees. You know this was very very typical of his work. And uh, that, of course, is gleaned from his early training as a sculptor. I mean, he worked, uh, first of all, before he went to the state at the feet of his father, who was also a traditional African sculptor, who um, carved uh, traditional stools of office and even religious images. Uh, so you see a lot of that in his work. And for me, that um, is that style of figuration where they exaggerated various uh, um, facets of the human anatomy to achieve rhythm, elongation, and movement. You know, you see a lot of that in his work. And he, for me, uh, he's an interpreter of the um, early traditional archetypes. Yeah, indeed. And uh, even, you know, when I showed that image of Ben in his studio on the right-hand side, I'm sure you noticed mm. the, uh, the, the head of uh, that young man. And this particular work uh, reminds me very much of it. Absolutely. Now, this is the wonderful, wonderful example that we have on the ex exhibition that you can see um, uh, next week in Cape Town. It's uh, very seldom that his work is exhibited in South Africa. And this is uh, the wonderful work. Uh, any comment on this one? <clears throat> Yes, uh, this is a major work, uh, Girls in Waiting. It was executed in 1959. And there again, you see the neck, you know, the um, torso, you see the limbs elongated to achieve that rhythm. You can see his bold use of line, you know, and that was very typical, you know, even of um, the early African paintings that you saw even on the cave walls. Um, so he's brought a lot of that into his uh, modernist practice. And what is very important about this work is uh, the year 1959. Now, this time, all over Africa, I mean, you mentioned earlier that Ghana had our independence in 1957. Um, at that time, it was very important for African artists to chart their course, to develop visual languages that will best describe the aspirations for 
a new continent. And this is how, um, especially at a time when African countries were gaining independence. Now, one characteristic element of Iwamu's work is uh, the female form, you know, and uh, that for me shows a very strong figurative bent. And in the female form, um, it was an embodiment not only of beauty, but it was an embodiment of rhythm, you know, nurturing, he described the female as a, a nurturing person, an, incu an incubator, one that uh, if you gave anything to would multiply it. And uh, you can see a lot of that even in late motifs in his work, like his masquerade themes, you know, where you see the woman or the female uh, masquerading very beautiful and uh, exaggerated dance poses that, you know, seem to defy gravity. So you see a lot of that in his work. And uh, this is one very fine example. If you look behind these girls in waiting, who for me are waiting, you know, at the very periphery of uh, the Nigerian independence and African countries emerging. You know, into their own at that time, you know, describing the aspirations of a new people. You'd see in the, very, in the background there, yeah, you see uh, geometric forms and shapes. And these are elements, formal elements that resonated all through his work. Now you can see the blend, as I mentioned earlier, of, uh, 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 and that hybridity where he was able to bring, you know, formal structures or conventions of uh, Western techniques and art that he learned at the slave. And there he's fusing that with his own. Uh, indigenous uh, geometric forms and shapes to give birth to his own uh, visual vocabulary, which best defined uh, Africa at that time. Uh, you look at the skin also, and you see the velvety skin, the blackness of the skin, and uh, that shows his meanings towards negative philosophy as espoused by Leopold Seda Songo, you know, who um, um, challenged um, Western domination and who fought to ensure that Africans you know, all over the world, or black people all over the world, rather, you know, were judged by the content of their character, not by their complexion, the texture of their hair, the color of their eyes. Yeah, absolutely fascinating analysis and uh, uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oliver. I'm moving Thank on you. to Nkhopoleng Moloi, uh, a writer, curator, uh, and uh, Nkhopoleng also wrote uh, the preface, the foreword to the catalogue. Uh, which will be available next week. Uh, uh, Hopoling, you, uh, your views on uh, figuration, uh, a modernist African art, uh, contemporary African art, you ask me to uh, show a series of uh, works by Santo Mofo King. Uh, and um, uh, so what are your views then on uh, figuration and uh, the role it plays in contemporary African art? Mm. Right, thank you so much, Valen, um, and thank you so much for everyone who's taking the time to join us this evening. I guess I just want to start off by saying this is quite an exciting time, but also quite daunting, um, you know, to be thinking about the figure, but also the fact that we're all having these thoughts publicly. So I just kind of want to preface that to say a lot of what I'm going to say is um, reflections essentially and none of none of it is kind of based in you know like um proper theorization or anything like that um it's very much kind of reflections based on my own experiences as a writer um but then also my own experiences in relation to blackness because every time when I think about the figure I kind of try to relate it to um the idea of the black figure in particular so the reason why Santumufu King is so crucial in how I relate to the figure. Um, there's actually four words. The first one is life. The second one is dignity. The third one is agency. And the fourth one is ritual. And maybe um, at certain points, we can even read a fifth one, which is refusal. But you know that's not kind of always there. Um, and a way to contextualize this is that anyone who's heard me talk about the figure in the last two years, for example, um, knows that I've kind of been reading the same quote over and over again. And I kind of want to share that quote with you, um, everyone who's here, just so that it can give you context in relation to some of my thoughts. So this is a quote by Darby English that I read at the beginning of last year. Um, and it's kind of just stayed with me um, basically for the past year. 
Darby English says, on the one hand, the figure is a sign of life. And in a protracted series of seasons of death, signs of life are utterly crucial and need to be honored absolutely. On the one hand, the proliferating figure is a clear market indicator when there's a taste for black art or blackness as art, i.e. the figure. So the figure can be quite satisfying and it can have an unthreatening presence because it goes down easy and therefore everyone's having a great fucking time. So you need to be able to make distinctions between say figures of black vitality, magical commodity figures, figures that challenge the terms of their commodification and figures that do important representational work precisely because they're hard to figure out, which is how we consume culture. And he goes on to say that for him, when he sees a figure, the first thing he needs to determine is what it is and what it is for. Is it a good witch or is it a bad witch? And now to kind of go back to Santi Mufu King and the four words um, that I kind of proposed as a way to think through his work, the thing that kind of comes up in Santi Mufu King's work is this idea of dignity. And I think for me, that's the thing that makes his work so compelling and makes his work so not only sensual, but it kind of draws you in. Santi, of course, spoke um, quite um, broadly about this idea of dignity through thinking around the shadow or evoking the shadows. So what he called Siriti. Um, he kind of thought about Siriti as an entryway into thinking through how he kind of photographs people and how that comes across in the actual image. So for him, the shadow, i.e. Siriti, revealed a more complex reading of how images are encoded and are decoded, particularly within the Black community. So the um, shadow or Siriti is believed to contain a person's essence. Um, it's kind of considered to embody the essence of a person. Um, it's kind of the uh, prescient perception of the inner idea of life. And once again, that word comes up, figures as signs of life or figures as things that move us towards life. And so a person's image cannot be separated from their shadow. Um, it can be read as an aura, as a presence, as dignity, or even as spirit. And so when we think around why we're seeing so many figures um, in this present moment, particularly figures of Black people, we kind of need to think about it in relation to the idea of humanization, the idea of rehumanization, and the idea of kind of humanity. Um, I think I've said quite a lot, so I, I, I'll leave it there and maybe chip in a little bit later. Uh, thank you for that. I think you added a, a very fundamental dimension to, uh, you know, figuration, and that is uh, the aspect of blackness. And also, thank you for for those codes, those four or five codes that you highlighted to to interpret, to unpack, to understand, uh, and to begin to think in new and different ways about that. I really appreciate that in Kopoling. Okay, uh, we're moving on to Alison Kearney an artist uh, in her own right, a researcher, an educator. Uh, and um, just for those of you who, who didn't know, today was her first day as a professor in the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture at the University of uh, Johannesburg. So Alistair, thank you very much for making time to join us um, on this platform. Talk about your own art for a moment. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, and it's lovely to be in um, the company of all our fellow panelists. I've turned my video off because the internet seems a bit unstable. So I'll wait, let me just wave. Hi, everyone. But I'm going to keep my video off so that um, my internet doesn't freeze. So um, yes, I, it, today has been, well, it's my first week as an associate professor of art history at UJ. I've come from uh, being a senior lecturer at WITS um, to UJ. So I'm having a very um, busy, but so far wonderful time. Um, these images on the screen at the moment are some early works of mine um, 
in which I was engaging with issues of art and value and thinking critically around what, um, who is memorialized in public sculptures, in public monuments, uh, but also in the sort of fields and discourses of art. Um, you can carry on. And next slide, please. Thank you. I um, extended um, those interrogations into looking at how um, the fields of art and museums and gallery spaces manufacture um, ways of looking and values for the works within them. And I think that um, although I haven't directly dealt with figuration in my own work, some of these issues and, and questions around um, audience, value, um, ways of looking especially and ways of looking at the body are emerging in uh, artists who work directly with the figure. So um, this is an installation of some plaster reproductions of the objects in my little museum called the Portable Hawkers Museum, which is an ongoing project. And I installed them in the um, plaster cast museum in Basel, which has reproductions of the Elgin marbles that are in um, the British, the British uh, museum. Yeah, yeah, the British Museum. So, and I placed my little replicas of snuffs and zambucks and bottles of poison alongside those um, figures to also talk about issues of authenticity of the reproduction and the status of the reproduction within that whole discourse of museums. Um, so, but I also work a lot um, as an educator, teaching in higher education, but also working with the um, education curators at the Fitz Art Museum to help develop the education program and to start thinking about how do we engage diverse audiences with artworks. So this is an image of um, school children engaging with the beadwork exhibition at Fitz Art Museum and adding their responses and thoughts around beadwork to the responsible that was installed as part of that exhibition. Um, so thank you, that's the intro. Thanks a lot. Uh, and um, then I also ask Alison to uh, have a sneak preview at the catalog and choose some of her favorite works that she wants to talk about. This is what's the first one. Okay, so thank you for that. Well, for me, what was so interesting around looking at the catalogue and the range of works on this exhibition was how the artists chosen seemed to me to enter into a dialogue with discourses of art. And that perhaps I see that in the work because that is also my area of scholarship and my interest in contemporary African art. Um, and so I thought this work by um, Teresa Kutala Vermino actually captures for me quite an interesting um, set of relationships that we can start to unpack when thinking about figuration. Um, because here on the one hand, the, the title, The God Behind the Glass, seems to point to the representation of this um, statue that looks like a um, carved African goddess of some kind. But I think that if we reverse that gaze, there's also a very clear identity of viewer that's being represented here. Um, and, and so the, the God behind the glass, if we were to adopt the position of the, the statue or the figure in the middle might be the art critic or the, you know, the, the um, art audiences and um, members of the, um, you know, structures of art, like, you know, us essentially, but also the, um, those involved in the art market. And so I thought that there's a, for me, an interesting uh, play on 
that which side of the glass are we looking at when thinking about who's behind the glass glass in this work and and I think that the artists who are um, quite self-consciously reflecting on these relationships within the art market and the discourses of art um, and also the materiality of painting and figuration and the you know making art are talking about the kind of two-way mirror both both gazes if that makes sense um so uh, can we move to the next one uh, just uh, also oh, to yeah. mention that uh, earlier on i mentioned the uh, book by sydney Cusper, and you'll recall that mm. one of the chapters is in fact that shifting gaze that mm. Alison has been talking about oh thanks for that um Yes, and so, and then I, I was also interested in this work by Robin Roder, uh, especially because of his um, use of these instruments of measurement, which uh, evoke for me that sense of um, all those uh, kind of bizarre instruments of measurements that came with um, a colonial gaze of the um, African body and the measuring and um, sort of abjection of the African body. And I think that he calls it Pan's Opticon also is a play on um, Bentham's Panopticon, exactly, which was a structure about utilizing um, the gaze as a mechanism of control so that inmates for the, the school or the prison would um, self-regulate their behavior would actually uh, adopt the gaze, right? So, so I think that there's an interesting relationship between those two works. I know um, Sean may be talking about this work in relation to other works as well on the exhibition later. Um, but I think one of the other interesting aspects of both of these works is how in pointing to looking, they also point to um, the, the work that art historians and art critics do, right? That in fact, a lot of what we say and write reveals our ways of seeing, right? So that even though the, um, you know, the, so the, the, the different constructions and interpretations of figuration over the past century have also, pointed not only to the works, but to ways that theorists have made meaning of the works and the, the, the kind of politics of looking. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so then I was thinking about, okay, how, what, how have people started and theorists written about figuration in African art and in relation to the artist? Um, and I was thinking about uh, the Inwizo and Okeke Gulu's book, which you also mentioned, Wilhelm, and how they, they talk about, in fact, there was a, a construction of African art and especially African artists working with um, figuration where the artists had to, certainly in South Africa, be connected to a kind of social realism that in representing the figure in space and the body in um, different contexts, there had to be a political element to the work. And I think that reading may shut down the sort of possibilities of abstraction. And also, and um, what I see in this work is um, a, a care and attention to materiality that I think is also present as much as a study of a of a everyday scene, but as as well the the way the paint um, pools in some areas on the paper or the transparency and delicacy of the the painting and fabrics in other areas. So um, those constructions of I think every, uh, of figuration and especially by um, South African artists working in um, 
you know, in the 80s and maybe late 70s, uh, their, their construction of their art as having to serve a, um, per, a, a kind of struggle agenda also detracts from the artist's concerns with art making and the materiality of art. And I yeah. think that- Alison, I think, you know, we, I was very pleased when you chose this one and uh, even more so when you sent me that uh, image of your own work, you know, the okay. public sculpture you did uh, outside the Metro uh, taxi, uh, taxi ranks, because I could just see, you know, the synergy between this work and the work that you did there. Oh, okay. uh, you also chose this one. Thank you. Sorry, I'm talking too long, maybe be about each one. I'll, I'll thanks for the little gentle nudge there. I'll um, <laughs> be a little bit briefer now. But yeah, so so I was so actually, what I'm interested in is how the um, discussions around figuration seem to try to uh, create categories which actually are uh, only one aspect of what I think the artists are doing. And I think that um, perhaps having a show like this where there's so many different artists works together across time and space and media um, is a good uh, step in opening up those questions, you know. So I, I then I chose, I, I was thinking about Sam and Klingetto in relation to the Sitlali because this is also an everyday scene, perhaps, but um, and, and apparent here is a different kind of working with material and perhaps a move to abstraction through the collage, but nevertheless, expression of, of you know, the figure in space. And yes, of course, taking into consideration the context in which the works are made and the time and the space that is being represented in, in both um, the Sihlali and Nflingetwa, there is a um, political dimension to the work that, um, that I think that, that it's not the only aspect of the work, maybe is the point that I want to make. Um, and I think that the artists are engaging a lot also with rhetorics of uh, figuration. And I don't think, um, I mean, you know, it's interesting that um, Oliver mentioned how some African modernist artists have been constructed as uh, copycats or trying only to um, you know, reproduce what happens in Europe. I think that there's a very strong sense in these works of a subjective exploration that is um, yeah, uh, uh, not mimicry at all. Thank you. Yeah. And then I, I, um, I, I thought of this work as well where the, there's a move towards abstraction in um, figuration, but that also belies the sort of constructions of abstract work as art for art's sake, or as only dealing with the aesthetic because of the subject matter. So I think there's a lot of evidence that against uh, interpreting these works as mimicry or as copying um, American and European modernists. Um, but that, again, in this work, in the materiality, how the paint is, has been manipulated on the surface also speaks of um, turmoil, speaks of, um, well, the title here is Riot, yeah. but yeah. yeah exactly. Thank you. Mm. And then again, I thought, um, just to end off, I'll, I'll end after this um, slide. Thanks, Wilhelm. Um, this work I found so interesting, um, just in terms of the dialogue that's emerging, I think, uh, between um, other broader contemporary discourses of art. So here, I you know, was thinking a lot about Afrofuturism mm. and a, an imagining of some kind of cyber body 
as well as mixed in with perhaps pastoral ideas of um, identity with the, that kind of broom and the um, garment that um, the figure's wearing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was interested that the title of the work is Reconnaissance. Um, it's sort of like the, the beginnings of an exploration. And I was, couldn't help but think about exploring outer space or exploring um, uh, the sort of cyberspace, which seems to be infinite, but is also on a chip. And that we, you know, that's so tiny, you know. And um, so I think that there's here again, the artists are, um, you know, presenting a quite a unique and subjective uh, interpretation of the figure, as well as engaging in quite critical ways with broader discourses of art. And uh, I'm sure the, the, the viewers uh, uh, now realize uh, the extent uh, and the depth of the works on exhibition, and I'm sure they can't wait for next week to go and have a look at, uh, at the mm. exhibition. Uh, uh, let's go on to Sean. Uh, Sean, uh, editor uh, of Long Standing, and I'm um, showing you a range of uh, Art South Africa's and many of these issues he actually uh, edited. And uh, I have to confess that uh, I couldn't wait for after every three months to look at uh, the new edition because Sean always introduced fascinating topics. Uh, to his writers and to his uh, readers, and also introduced me to a vast array of uh, contemporary artists, uh, most of which I've never heard of before. So thank you, Sean, for that. Sean is also a brilliant author. His most recent publication, Irma Stern, African in Europe, European in Africa, and that uh, dichotomy I quite like in his title. Uh, and um, a, a curator of note, his most recent uh, 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 show um, the Congress social body in three figurative paintings at the Novel Foundation. It just ended a month ago. And he also sent me some installation photographs. Some of you might have been uh, fortunate to see some of these. Um, but Sean, uh, you wrote in the catalog about Jürgen Schadeberg. And these are the nine uh, uh, works of his uh, included in the show. Tell us about Jürgen Schadeberg. Tell, tell us about these works. I am going to take the liberty of both uh, journalism and storytelling. So I'm going to start in 2015. And my story sort of uh, loops back to Popper Lang's pictures of the train church which were actually incorrectly captioned, that's 1986. Um, Jürgen Schadeberg, these images perhaps would not have been lodged in the public memory as emphatically as they are now, if it weren't for the fact that um, he returned to South Africa in the 80s and um, got involved in litigation with the drum publisher, Jim Bailey, um, pursuing his copyright to get his work back. He produced two books as a kind of culmination of that uh, process and featuring not only his photographs, but uh, photographers like uh, Bob Kassani, Peter Magbane, um, Elf Kamala, who all, uh, I suppose, did their time in the trenches of editorial, particularly at Drum Magazine. Um, What's interesting and how this loops back to Lang is that uh, Santu was living in Soweto at the time to take the train and bus out to Lanseria, where Jürgen was working on the Bailey farm. And he was often tired and much irritated by the religious singing going on in the train and very motivated uh, <laughs> on one level to shut it out. And one way was to photograph it, I guess. Uh, the other was, would be to try sleep. Um, I suppose why I share that story is that I think one can often go on expeditions with a figure and make uh, very big interpretive claims. And the continent has certainly suffered that from a lot of uh, art historians, curators, critics. I think it's also important to 
remind and remember and to investigate the circumstances of particular works. Um, you know, I'm jumping around here, but for instance, the image at the bottom in the center, the couple dancing, uh, I wrote about it. I interviewed Jürgen about it uh, many years ago. Um, it was photographed in Sophia Town and it was photographed at one of the dance halls there that would pop up in one of the two cinemas or bioscopes as they were called. Um, is that formally a portrait? No, probably not. It's more of a kind of nightclub scene, uh, which keys into a whole tradition in photography. But if you look at that image closely, I find it amazing. Um, it asks questions about the kind of archive and memory, particularly of the apartheid period. Was pleasure, are we allowed to speak of pleasure during a time that's overriding the scene as uh, the opposite of pleasure? Um, I don't know where to actually head with the conversation, so I'm going to stop short because we're almost like out of time. I would like no, to don't worry, don't worry. Uh, uh, keep going, keep going. Uh, in the catalog essay that uh, uh, you wrote, you wrote at length about this this particular work. Yeah, um, drum. Bear in mind, even though despite its huge acclaim, was a white-owned project. And we should bear this in mind in relation to a lot of the Black Federation that is being traded at market in the presence, in the present tense. And that is the invisible hand of white operators uh, creating either images or creating value. Um, in this, why this is, how this relates to that kind of, uh, let's say, editorial remark is that drum was um, started by white entrepreneurs targeting Black cosmopolitan readership. Its first issues were entirely parochial. They presented what the white middle class thought a Black urban readership would be interested in, being kind of tribal images and um, very paternalistic vision. Um, that quickly pivoted when the readership kind of spoke back. And one of the introductions was the idea of a pinup uh girl as, as the person was called and this lady was one of the most famous of the early pinup girls um i mean interestingly there's a whole history of these sort of uh male gaze to use that word of um female subjects if one looked at rise and fall of the project which Aquian Weasel curated it included tiny jason's pinups made in the, the 70s um uh, so this Form, which was introduced in the mid 50s was very durable and uh, extended long past its sell by date. Um, this wasn't necessarily a pinup as such. I, I suppose it was an image of cosmopolitan aspiration, which is very important to recognize when a lot of the um, authorized books by particularly white photographers were selling a tribal identity. There was this kind of counter image that was uh, being produced. But it's important to bear in mind that it appeared in magazines, which Oliver will tell you are very temporal. One magazine succeeds another, and you forget about the one that was produced three before. Um, and it was only in the retrieval of this archive and its publication in books and in exhibitions that it slowly Returned to public consciousness and moved beyond being some kind of ephemeral record of an editorial idea into, I suppose, a far more distilled portrait of an era, some of its aspirations and some of its truths, too. Indeed. Um, so I also want to remind you of uh, this uh, exhibition in 2008. And uh, I came across this particular work uh, by uh, Kalifala Asibide, uh, a Malian woman. And there you also have, you mentioned the male gaze, but also, you know, looking at the self here, uh, a Mali woman looking in the mirror. Any, any thoughts about this work? I don't know the history too well. I remember very clearly the exhibition in 2008. Um, I remember Ben and Wanwu's uh, portrait and the striking 
skin tones and it suddenly clarifying Zuletu Matetu's pastels, for example, or some of um, even Vladimir Trechikov's uh, portrayals of black subjects with very ripe purple skins. I'd always thought they were problematic, but suddenly it was a very different tradition that they sort of gestured towards. Um, my only response to this is look at early George Pember, look at George Bengu. Um, both of them urban born artists that sentimentalized the rural and also um, looked to it lost or fragile or disappearing customs as a kind of vestige of something that deserved to be recorded. Um, interestingly enough, George Pember came to Cape Town in 1942, met Gerard Sokoto, who told him, stop painting watercolors, stop depicting rural scenes, look at modern life. And I suppose, you know, in a sense, it's part of the larger frame of the conversation today. What happens when you confront modern life? It's something Europe did in the 19th century. No, exactly, exactly. You also were interested in this juxtaposition with the Kentridge on the left and the Robin Roder that uh, Alison spoke about. I suppose there's some very obvious um, overlaps in the images and these tools that are augment, augmenting looking. I mean, I suppose you could argue that Zoom is a tool to augment looking. It's a very uh, you know, impoverished tool compared to being in a gallery and looking at work in person. Um, there's no great insight here. I think, you know, what struck me just in the unexpected pairing in the catalog was a conversation that um, William and Robin had in the late 2000s, where in a sense, when Robin moved on from his performative photography into other media, one suddenly saw these great uh, overlaps in terms of interests. As I said, no great insight. Okay, and uh, I want to end with uh, uh, your latest uh, show that uh, is being mounted as we speak. Uh, it is uh, the A4 Arts uh, Foundation in Cape Town. And if I'm not mistaken, this uh, opens on Friday. Correct, um, burning of parliament and the reuse of City Hall on Thursday meant that we had to shift the dates because A4 is located right next to City Hall. Um, my exhibition is called Photo Book, Photo Book, Photo Book, um, different spellings. Uh, the, the wall you're looking at, incidentally, makes an intervention around the idea of the studio. Most South African photographers, if you look at the evidence of the photo books, were effectively plenarists. They found their subject in the field. They, in the main, didn't seem to make studio photography. These three examples suggest versions or ideas of the studio. Uh, on your left, Sam de Blom, in the center, Roger Ballen and at right, uh, studio work by Robin Roeder, if you will, shut outdoors. Um, for those of you who have memory, 1994, uh, Roger Ballen's book, Platteland, featured what was seen as very withering portraits of white subjects. And he was subjected to death threats. Um, it, was, it was a very strong critical backlash. So the figure, I guess, um, you know, can elicit deep emotion, particularly when there's a feeling that the subjects are somehow being violated, particularly in photography, that the exchange isn't equal, that there's some other agenda. Come see my exhibition. I'll oh, certainly. Oh, through. certainly, Sean. We will definitely uh, go and uh, see what it is all about. Um, so, so I just want to end by thanking all the speakers and also to remind uh, the viewers that next week, the 14th of February, we open an online sale uh, with many, many, many great contemporary African art uh, um, 
uh, on uh, on offer so please do check that out again uh, preview will probably also start this friday but certainly the bidding would uh, would start uh, on monday the 14th if there are any questions uh, arisha is hosting this and she will alert me to any questions or if you want to use the chat function to make a comment or ask a question uh, now is the time uh, we uh, we uh, we made good time but certainly for those of you who want to stay on ask questions uh, uh, now is the time just uh, use the, the various options uh, available to you thanks once again to uh, four wonderful speakers I think we we go away with a deeper understanding of figuration and how it is uh, explored by not only modernist African artists, but also contemporary African artists. Thank you very much. Mm. Can, can I ask a question to my fellow panelists? Certainly, Sean. I mean, it's very, it's a simple one. Do you think we, as both viewers, but thinking viewers, overly fetishize the figure? Uh, okay, let's put that, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I wonder if I can put that to Alison. Alison, what are your thoughts about that one? You know, I was thinking, just ask me easy questions, please. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's okay. Um, I, I mean, I think that maybe we over fetishize the artwork and the whole relationship in, of viewing um perhaps um i don't know if we over fetishize the figure more than other forms of representation personally um but i i, I was struck by and I, I agree with your comment though that when the we see a figure that seems to be hurt or tortured exploited i think there's a very emotive response more so um maybe when the representation seems benign you know so i was thinking of the that image you showed um, wilhelm with the um, the watercolor and woman looking in the mirror that seems benign but actually we we could engage with it um, critically um but but i think that the it might be a less a strong emotion than when we see an overt uh, torture or, you know, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. It does, it does. Can I jump oh, in for um, a second? Oh, sorry. Olivia, certainly, you go, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about is why is it that when someone says figure, we immediately think a person or portrait or portraiture, um, specifically because figure has been and is used um, in other ways, you know. So Maria Lind speaks about um, the figure kind of being um, an object, like for example, an object is as much a figure as a landscape as an image of a person and often in geometry when you name things um, you can actually kind of use that as a prefix and so one of the things that I was struggling with um, as I was writing the forward is this idea of like why is it that figure has to um, kind of always be drawn to this idea of like people mm. um, and in that way you know, is it like fetishization? Is it because we kind of like to see and speak about ourselves and reflect on ourselves? Um, like, why is it that when we speak about the figure, we aren't considering like images of like animals, you know, where we just have like all of these paintings of animals and we are decoding them in terms of what they mean or our relationship with them. So I think that is an aspect of that, but also maybe part of it is historical just because the body is so laden with so much history and so much trauma and so much um, conflict and complexities. So then that means that perhaps there's more to kind of think through than if we were talking about like other things as figures. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, very interesting that you mentioned that because if you just think of uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, you know, when it started, it started out as uh, being a museum of non-objective art. You know, uh, she was obviously referring to uh, uh, abstract art, uh, but, you know, the figure as object, as you say, you know, sort of figurative, non-figurative art, and that figuration there, as you rightly say, you know, you think of uh, Mark, the German expressionist, you know, uh, portraying animals and that is essentially figurative art you're absolutely right in are there any other questions yeah if i may just uh... oh yes oliver <clears throat> oliver i think you muted yourself yeah can you hear me now <laughs> yes, we can yes hear you. I, I keep doing that yes i'm sorry about that well i just want to add uh, a few um, points to what the previous speakers uh, said. I uh, like what uh, I think the very last one said about uh, the historical uh, um, angle. I think that's very important because right from time the body has always been celebrated as one of beauty, you know, and um, it's at the same time a contested fight for so many things, and people have been able to politicize the body, for instance, and when you talk about the gaze, or whose gaze is it? You know, even ideals of aesthetics and beauty, for instance, you know, by whose parameters are we judged by? I mean, the Greeks have their own definition of beauty. Africans have their own definition of beauty. Whose parameters, you know, are we judged by? There's also nudity. The body has been used, I mean, even in Nigeria and Africa, you know, as a, a site of protest. You know, I know that, um, um, the Alaki of Agbaland in those days, I mean, about uh, 30, 40 years ago, was unseated because uh, the women came out in full nudity. Talking about women, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, sometimes uh, their bodies can be objectified. You know, at the same time, there's um, uh, an angle of a woman owning their own sexuality. So I think because it's so interesting, you know, and uh, there's so many angles and it's such a contested site that... Uh, is more or less like a battlefield, if I must quote uh, one very uh, renowned uh, uh, historian. So it's a battle battlefield where so many angles and so many things come into play. It's also a landscape, you know, of some sort. So I think this is why it's such, um, you know, an, a, a, an object of interest, if I must say, and that has been sustained, you know, almost from the beginning of uh, Art Farsic, uh, yeah. uh, you know, if one must put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, and certainly I think, uh, uh, Oliver, I agree with you, you know, the uh, uh, figuration, the body has not been exhausted, I think, by artists. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, uh, shall we end the discussion here? Most lively, most interesting, most insightful. Again, thank you very much uh, for our four panelists. Uh, we certainly uh, took a lot away from uh, of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Please join us Thank also you. on Wednesday for the next in the series, where we are going to look specifically at uh, the issue of collecting contemporary African art. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.